gosh, my back. Oh. Rachel's making some weird sound effects that she'll add in later. I think I just broke my back. I don't you know. didn't move. <laughs> Nothing <laughs> happened. I, just, I thought you were pooping. <laughs> Oh my gosh, you look so short. You are short. I need like a freaking booster seat. We should have done this post Dutch Bros so that people get our best energy. <laughs> <laughs> you doing the intro? Yeah. Do you want me to do it? No. No, I would like to stitch right. <laughs> What's up? <laughs> hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Thank you so much for joining us today for another video. In today's video, we have a very special guest, Mr. Hunter Hughes. Say hello. Hello. <laughs> We are going to be talking about something that's actually pretty serious today. We are trying to give you guys our best energy, even though the topic we are going to be talking about is a really difficult one. And the primary reason that we wanted to make this video was because I wish that I had a video to watch that was like this when we were going through the NICU and we were processing things differently. And it really felt like our marriage was quite fragile at the time because of the trauma that we were going through. We are going to be talking to you guys about the way we handled the NICU very, very differently from one another and what it really looked like our day to day while we were going through that experience and the way that it's impacted our marriage and where we're currently at now. I think that Hunter and I would both agree that the NICU was a really, really different experience for the both of us, even though we were going through the exact same thing. Yeah. The NICU for me was a very cherished experience at times because I was very needed in the NICU. As the mother for Beckham, it was really all about Beckham and then secondary all about me. I was the one who was primarily prioritized aside from the nurses, of course, and any like opportunity that we had to touch Beckham, to hold Beckham, to do his cares, to give him a bath. That privilege was definitely given to me first. And I definitely think that must have been kind of hard as his dad. I mean, I'm sure that you wanted me to have those experiences and Hunter would have been the first person to offer it to me first, but I'm sure that was kind of sad for you that I was the one who got to do skin to skin, even though your heart was really broken too. Was that you know, hard? actually not really, not necessarily just because Rachel loves just so deeply because your love was just so infinite for him right off the gate as it should be, right? You're his mom. But in saying that, I was super grateful because one of my biggest concerns, actually Rachel's dad and I grew very close through this process because, so my father-in-law, because as we were going through this, one of our huge concerns was for Rachel. There were so many uncertainties when the NICU process I guess we'll call it started between knowing whether or not we would take Beckham home. And so any time there was hope or any time there was something good happening where you could change his diaper or put your hands through, you know, that, that small box that kept him alive, I was super grateful. So when you had those skin to skin moments, it wasn't hard on me because I was so concerned for my wife and her, I mean, guys, it was such a fragile state. Everything was so fragile. And when him and I would talk, so many of these prayers were dedicated to Rachel on her behalf. Just, you know, hoping that as the doctors and, and God takes care of Beckham, that whatever his path was, because Rachel and I both believed whatever was going to happen was going to happen, even though you fought on his behalf. Yeah, for sure. I definitely think that it was preordained. Like God knew if Beckham was gonna live or yeah, not. Yeah, sure. I think that Beckham's life always had an intention to be the way that it is, but that didn't make anything any easier. I mean, it was still like a really terrifying experience. And that is so incredibly sweet of you because looking back, I definitely had a difficult time giving up any attention that I was able to give him. So if Hunter and I were both in the NICU and only one of us had time to do skin to skin, like it was gonna be me. And that wasn't me trying to be selfish. It was just something that I couldn't control. Like I longed to hold my baby so badly. Oh my word, will we ever have a video where I'm not bawling the whole entire time? But also rightfully so. I mean, <laughs> yeah. with what happened with Rachel's wreck, if you haven't seen, you know, basically part one to what happened, you need to yeah. go back and watch that. But I'll go ahead and leave a little card for you guys so it'll the, be linked. The doctor said countless times that neither her nor Beckham should be alive, right? Like they both should have died. And so technically speaking, <laughs> It made sense that she got to do skin to skin. <laughs> <laughs> That's very sweet of Hunter. Yeah, I think that we just had different roles in the NICU. And so we we'll kind of dive into like what the day to day was like. For me personally, I was healing from my own accident as well and from my own injuries. Fortunately, nothing was permanent aside from the nerve damage in my leg, but we're hoping that comes back one day. If not, it literally doesn't affect my life whatsoever, so it's totally okay. I would wake up, go to the chiropractor in the morning, and we live an hour away from the hospital, and then I would drive straight to the hospital, and I would be there 
literally the entire day. I was fortunate enough to be able to work from the hospital. I have like these cute little photos. If I can find one, I'll totally post it on the screen, but I would have Beckham like on my chest and I would be typing on my laptop working because there was like a little desk that would come over the chair. I remember like my biggest complex of the day would be like, I have to pee so bad, but like there's no way <laughs> I'm putting him back in his crib. The NICU definitely started out more strict. Like when Beckham was more sick, we had to be there at like specific times in order to be able to do his cares is what they call it. And it's because Beckham was on like low stim or non-stim, meaning they wanted him stimulated as little as possible. It was like really hard on me emotionally to get to the hospital at the exact time that I needed to because we did live an hour away and I had to like get up there and be in the room by a specific time every day or I missed the opportunity to be able to like change his little diaper and be able to give him a little swab of breast milk with a Q-tip. And that was like a really, really special experience for me because it's the only thing that I was allowed to do. And then once those care times were over, we were supposed to leave him in his incubator so that he could just rest. And of course, like I wanted to do what was best for him, but my heart was in that incubator. It was an out of body experience. Like I literally feel like I was so connected to Beckham. I obviously still am, but at that time it was a new feeling. I was just learning the yeah. love of a mother. I was also struggling because I was trying to pump so that I could breastfeed him in whatever way that I could. So, oh my word, pumping was like the most stressful experience ever. I would have so much anxiety if we were trying to do anything and we missed a pump and I missed a feeding and I would be so terrified my milk was gonna drop. I was also barely producing anything because I was barely eating, barely sleeping. And I could wasn't, barely function. He wasn't breastfeeding. It was right. strictly right. pumping because Yeah, and that's not going to stimulate you the way a baby would. Right. So it was just like a whirlwind of emotions and like the schedule that I was trying to be on was so overwhelming and I was just like mentally not there, especially for Hunter. Like as a wife, I was so checked out because I wasn't even a person for myself. I was literally living for Beckham. My heart was beating for Beckham. So the only thing that I was at that point was a mother and that really affected our relationship. Hunter was obviously in the exact same position. If I can't give him anything and he can't give me anything back, obviously it, it hurt our relationship and our relationship was really like hanging on by a thread yeah. while we were in the NICU from natural consequence. We have fortunately been able to talk to a lot of other couples that have been through similar trauma and they all have the exact same experience because you just process so differently. Like Hunter's day-to-day -day life looked completely different than mine even though we were going through the exact same thing. Yeah, so my day-to-day -day was entirely different from Rachel's because once we got settled in, after the first month, which was, I think we were really numb. You know, we were in the hospital and then we went to the Ronald McDonald and there was no, time or reason to nurture our relationship because every other day we were being told Beckham wasn't going to make it. Yeah. And so we weren't in a, you know what I mean? We weren't in any type of routine. We, and we weren't working or anything. Like Hunter mentioned, we were staying yep. at the Ronald McDonald house and so. Nothing else mattered to us. Yeah. Nothing. But after about that month is when, you know, she was going to the NICU and like she described it for me, I started thinking again, okay, you know, Beckham seems healthy and we are going to need to bring him home eventually. So I need to make sure I can provide for my family. We kind of drifted apart from that sense because my day to day was wake up, want and need to go to the NICU and Rachel also always wanted me there. She of course loved going so much and it was a privilege to be there. And it was important that I felt the same way. She wanted me to really experience I wanted you to the feel same, exactly how the same I felt. emotions she felt, right? Yeah. And to navigate through them the exact same way she does, um, which I which I didn't. Which is an unfair expectation to have, but I think I had this internal complex where Hunter was thinking optimistically, like, okay, Beckham's gonna come home, and we're gonna have a life full of medical bills, which is what we wanted because that means our baby is at home. Right, but Hunter's sure. also financially going, I don't really think I can take four months off of work. Hunter actually owns his own company and it's like vital for him to work. And so I think he felt like pulled in two different directions. Like I need to work for Beckham's future and then I also need to live for Rachel and her emotions right now. And I like understood where he was coming from, but it didn't make it any easier that it's I was hard. at the NICU alone. She wanted her husband there yeah. every single day, which might have been an unrealistic expectation. Um, but I understand yeah. where she's coming from. I mean, our, our, we didn't know if our son was going to ultimately come home or not. Day after day, I would, I would try and make it up to the NICU as often as possible. I'd say an average between one to two times a week. Like two to three. Okay. I mean, it, where Rachel was there seven days a week. Yeah. Almost 
always eight hours or more. I mean, sometimes she would be there from like, she would get up there first thing, I mean, truly like seven a.m., which meant she left at 6 a.m. and she would get home at like 10. And the thing was, was that even if I was home from the NICU, like emotionally, I was still there. I was literally on the phone with the NICU nurses first thing in the morning, right before I went to bed, and we were just like, Totally oh, separate. And, yeah, and emotionally. You were on the phone with them three yeah. times. Yeah. Oh, if I wasn't there, minimum. I was on the phone. Yep. With the NICU. <laughs> yep. She had a close personal relationship with the nurses, so she yeah. would call them. So again, as each day passed, it was one less day that we had spent even talking to each other. I mean, I remember the conversations. I don't know if you remember totally. this, but these conversations we used to have kind of went like, hey, whenever we do bring Beckham home, because all of our conversations needed to be hopeful. That's not to say they all were and we didn't have our moments, but it was, at what age do you want to bring Beckham to Disneyland? We would talk like that all the time. Are we going to buy him a car on his 16th birthday? That's how our conversations went. It was all Beckham focused, and that's how we spoke, because we had to. Yeah, I think that's really how we like held on to our relationship. Yeah. It's like the one thing that we could bond over. Just for like a little background, when we got pregnant with Beckham, we had a very solid marriage oh, and yeah. we're very strong and didn't have any major issues. Of course, like we had disagreements, but nothing out of the norm. Never ever would have imagined that our marriage would fall apart for really any reason. We made it through the year mark, guys. I mean, we were good. <laughs> yeah, so we were three <laughs> we were three years married when yep. Beckham was born. And yeah, actually right before he was born, we went and celebrated our anniversary. So our anniversary is actually on June eleventh. Beckham was born on June thirteenth. Big surprise yep. to us. And we were just like, oh my goodness, like this is such an incredible This chapter. time next year we'll lives. have a little boy. Yeah. Yeah, things were going great and I mean, seriously, it just hits you like a brick. I mean, like, it's like how we felt. The entire time that we were in the NICU, and I think we just kind of like looked up after a few months, and we were just kind of like, oh, I also have a spouse. I'm not just a parent. And I know everyone, everyone who has a child in, in the NICU and has a spouse can relate to this. And that's why I feel it's so important to make this video because we would discuss things with our nurses because we were so close to them. And I think they could kind of feel that there was tension. And a lot of times when we were up at the NICU, we weren't up there together. And I think Hunter and I were having a difficult time dealing with the idea that we processed emotion differently, but I can't even blame us. I mean, we were both so valid in the way that we were feeling and the way that we were thinking that we really just had to kind of like put our heads down and get through this time frame and get back home for us to allow our relationship to start to rebuild at that point. The NICU nurses were telling us, you know, it's a very, very normal for your marriage to suffer in the NICU. I think they even threw a statistic at us that like 50% yep. of all marriages oh, yeah, end over, over the NICU yeah. or during the NICU or after the NICU, something like that. They, I mean, they had given us countless examples of people yeah. who had had extended stays in the NICU and they got divorced. I mean, our nurses, yeah. every single one of them had dealt with that. And when you look up and you haven't gone on a date in months, I mean, truly, we didn't oh. We didn't go on a date. We weren't we, going we hated, and grabbing coffee yeah. or soda or we hated trying the to spend idea. time with each other because it, sound, it felt like we were doing something without our family, 100%. without our other family member. We right? felt a ton of guilt. Oh, absolutely. We like couldn't. Hunter felt guilt if he wasn't working. I felt guilt if I wasn't in the NICU. And when we, we were conversing and happy, can't really think of many times that that happened because it was like, we can't be happy right now. Beckham's not home. He hasn't made it. He hasn't made it, right? Yeah, so it was really, really difficult whenever you look up and all of a sudden you don't know how to communicate with your partner or what to even you know talk about. It's not that we lost the communication skills, we just lost topics to even converse yeah. about because we didn't care about anything else, nothing. Nor did we lose any love for each other and I want that to be super clear. It was just that our relationship was no longer our priority and I think anyone, even with a baby that doesn't go to the NICU, yeah, right. <laughs> when you bring so. a newborn baby home and mm -hmm. mom is up all night and she's really stressed out and dad is working and it's a very, it's a very confusing time for your marriage and for your relationship because both of you are focused on the baby and you have to put things in place where yep. you can focus on your relationship. Hunter and I actually were going to therapy at this time and I do think that it really helped us, but we were much more surface level than we typically were. It was obviously hard for us to go out in public and it was just difficult because we were hopeful but it was hard to be completely positive because I was so sad. I was so sad that I didn't have a baby at home. I remember we would go on walks when I would get home from the hospital at night and kind of talk about our day and talk about how things were going. And I just, all I could talk about was Beckham. It's, 
I didn't even like want to hear about anything else, talk about anything else. And again, else. like rightfully so. It's kind of one of yeah. those, if anyone's ever experienced that loss of a family member when the world stops for you, but for everybody else it's moving, That's it was that way for four months. And I'm sure many of you have experienced that before for even longer periods of time. Yeah, I think another thing that is, you know, important to be mindful of is that Beckham was in the NICU for a significantly longer amount of time than most babies go to the NICU for. So something else that was straining was that we were watching everyone else's babies go home and that was super difficult for me. Now I want to make things very, very clear. I was so happy for those mothers. I sobbed tears of jealousy. I didn't want to take that experience from them at all. I just wanted to also be in that position. So I was so incredibly depressed and anxious and sad that I think it was hard for anyone to have a conversation with me. And I think that's totally valid that I felt that way. 100%. But I think it was difficult for Hunter as like my protector and provider for him to look at me completely broken and he know he can literally do nothing to fix it. Our entire marriage, he's built me up and loved me and helped me flourish. And now we're in this position where he quite literally is helpless. And I think that was a major hit to just your manhood and like your natural role in a family to be able to keep the family together. Almost my like sense of purpose. A hundred percent. I couldn't fix anything. I couldn't make her happy even when she was sad yeah. because she didn't want to. One of the things that I do and like when things are tricky or hard is I'll make her laugh. You know, I just, I'll You guys around. know, you know. And she didn't want, she's like, I don't want to laugh. That's not, yeah. that's not something I'm after right now. It's not something I'm seeking right now. I just want my son. Now in saying all of this, we're not saying we're ungrateful or woe was me in any type of way. We're just trying to say that you have to have patience, especially as a married unit in these circumstances because for us, we had the absolute best case scenario. I mean, anyone that's seen any other video can see we have the most beautiful little boy in the entire world. He's our light and so is our little girl. And we just, we couldn't have had a better outcome, but in the moment, this is where our relationship was at. Yeah, I think that if you are experiencing any type of trauma, it can even be like with a family member. I just had a really close friend experience a very severe trauma in her immediate family. And although her and I have extremely different circumstances because she actually had a family member pass away, we were able to really relate on the idea that it's difficult to lean on other people who are experiencing the same trauma. So I think it's really important to find somebody outside of your family unit, like a therapist, who you can both go to and rely on and work on your communication skills because it's obviously difficult for Hunter and I to support one another if we both feel like we're totally broken and weak. And I'm really, really grateful that we were going through therapy at that time because that really helped propel us forward. And it also prepared us for Blakely because even though Blakely was a totally different experience, it's difficult to have a newborn and for us to have totally different roles. And I think it kind of goes back to like, when I'm like yelling, I need help in the middle of the night, but Hunter doesn't have a boob. Like what's he supposed to do, yeah. you know? I think we took a lot of this out on our relationship unnecessarily. Yeah. So if I were to have any piece of advice from what I learned from this is if you can't go on a date for three months because of a, a trauma or a tragedy or four months or six months or a year, and you can't find something to talk about because you're both going through the same thing, don't blame it on your relationship. I think both of us kind of went, our relationship, like our marriage is failing because we haven't done X, Y, Z and we haven't hit like, the metrics we were supposed to for this month. We didn't do like yeah. our two dates and our three conversations totally. or you know, what have you. And I think whenever we finally looked up and went, we haven't talked or had a chance to have any intimacy like going on a date or just spending some time together on a car drive in four months, we went, oh, well, then our relationship, like it, it's not working yeah, out. Yeah, you question, you question where you're at and you're so hard on yourself and so critical because you see a highlight reel of everybody else and you just think like when someone else has a newborn baby and that baby's not in the NICU and they're posting all about how wonderful it is to be yeah. playing with their baby and all of these things and you just kind of look at your spouse and go like, well, I don't feel that. We don't have that family unit. <laughs> and to top it off, you're completely emotionally drained. Oh yeah, you don't, you're barely you surviving. You don't want to have patience or tolerance. You kind of almost want to have something to fight over, be 
upset about because you're hurting yeah. so badly internally. It's like at when times. you need to cry it out. Right. Legitimately, right. it's like when you need to cry it out. And that would manifest in random ways through both of us in our relationship yeah. because of this trauma. Oh yeah, absolutely. I think it is so incredibly important and one of the best pieces of advice I've ever been given in my entire life is you never make a permanent decision based on temporary yeah. emotion. Yeah. And that is something that I really, really hope everyone can take away in any situation that involves any sort of trauma or heartache. And I am just so grateful that we never made any final decisions on our yeah. marriage and that we were able to stay somewhat objective and know that everything that we were feeling was temporary and circumstantial because yeah. it was, it was circumstantial. If you removed the circumstance of the NICU, we had and still have a phenomenal marriage and that doesn't mean that it's perfect. I really have to preface that because it's not like it's sunshine and rainbows every single day. I mean, my word, we have like two babies and we're yeah. running around like crazy people. We both own our own businesses and it's just wild. But you're we, married to me. You're married to someone that's. Oh. <laughs> it's true. I thought that was the it's butt. True. Just kidding. No, but we have a, a great foundation, yeah. and it is so cool to look back and be like, damn, we did that. Like, we got through that. We are so incredibly strong because of it. And I feel like I could get through anything with this guy. And you can make me laugh next time. I think I would be more, <laughs> more open to it. <laughs> Same. Thing. Man, I liked your advice. I wish I had like a cool quote. Maybe I'll Google one. You can cut it in. <laughs> you guys, thank you so incredibly much for watching this video. It's obviously kind of hard to open up about some of these vulnerable topics, especially when it has to do with our marriage and our love for one another. But we just really hope that this video is able to help somebody else going through something similar and that you're able to reach out to somebody to help you because I'm grateful for the help that we had and the support that we had and that we were able to come out stronger because of it. Full discretion, this is actually our second time filming this because the first time it was so difficult to get through and work through all the things we wanted to share that we just kind of went, hey, let's do it on a different day and take another swing at it then. But we did it because we really felt like we wanted to share just our experience in yeah. case someone ever ends up or is already in the situation that we were in. Yeah, sometimes I question like, is this too personal to share? Yeah. And then, I also look back and realize like if I had known that other people experienced trauma in their marriage when they experienced trauma outside of their marriage and it's a mutual trauma, I think I would have felt more at peace and not questioned where we were so much. That things will change. Right, like, that exactly. It's that temporary. Light at the end of the tunnel. 100%. Yeah. Thank you guys so incredibly much for watching this video. You know how much we love you. And if you haven't yet, go ahead and hit that red subscribe button so you never miss any future videos. We love and appreciate you guys so much and love this community that we're building. If you like this video, go ahead and give it a thumbs up. It really does help out my channel and I am so appreciative. And we will catch you guys in the next one. Bye.